to get started here? Okay. So Chris is my personal PowerShell guru. Uh, over the past 20 years, he's moved from desktop software development to web applications, then Linux, and ultimately Windows System Administration, specializing in high sensitivity and high security environments. Please join me in welcoming Chris to ShellCon 2017. Hi, everybody. I did demute myself, right? All right, cool. How's everybody doing today? Good. Awesome? Good. Awesome? Cool. Uh, welcome, welcome. Um, well, let's just get going, right? Let's, uh, no formalities. Uh, who am I? Mm, I don't think anyone really cares, so we're just going to skip over this. Uh, what we're going to be doing <laughs> are um, looking at how to author uh, practically author implants for Windows in PowerShell. Um, we have Linux now, PowerShell, so I kind of have to be specific, although it sucks. Um, very specifically, <laughs> very specifically focused on post exploitation, post uh, post uh, escalation, privilege escalation, malicious code. Uh, I'm not trying to do all the rest of the things. We're focusing on one particular part today: uh, post exploitation implants. Um, we're going to probably run about the full time, uh, about the first two thirds of the talk is code samples for implants. Um, we're going to start with some easy stuff uh, to get on the same page, then we're going to go off the deep end. Um, we'll have about one sixth of the talk for packaging because it's pretty easy, and then one sixth for persistence because there's like two good ways and you should just use those and you don't really care about the other uh, 20 or so. Um, I, I kind of had to do all the W's, so sorry. So while we're doing this, why we're doing this talk is because of script kitties. I'm tired of running into them. So some of you guys know what you're doing. That's cool. Some don't, and I want you to learn. I keep hearing over and over again the same stuff. There's some cool new hack, uh, some new thing that come out, new exploit. And we have this, these cool marketing buzzwords, and someone makes this really weirdly named tool that does a really weirdly named hacks, and then we get the box. And I'm you know, talking to people, I'm like, oh, that's really cool. Like, how does that work? I'm like, um, like PowerShell. I'm like, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> like, how does that work? Like, oh, PowerShell. And it's fine, like the space, like the InfoSec space is huge now. There's so many different things to do, um, so many different specializations. I don't think you need to know everything about everything. Quite the opposite, really. Um, but something that is um, ubiquitous and pervasive and important now as PowerShell is, you should at least have a basic understanding. So we're going to look at code the entire time um, for your core understanding of certain areas of PowerShell that facilitate writing implants. If you want the cool hotnesses, I'm not here about hotnesses, I'm here about fundamentals. Hotness gets you Nike contracts, but fundamentals win games. The hotness is right there. If all you want is a hotness, you're done. You want to know how to bypass uh, AMSI? There's a couple of ways. This guy's probably the easiest way. Um, you want to obfuscate your code. Um, Daniel Bohannon's stuff is Awesome. He's got a bunch of a library for eating PowerShell and obfuscating stuff. Just do that. I mean, we can give an entire talk on obfuscating, uh, obfuscating PowerShell, but just use the guy's library because it's it works. It's awesome. Um, you want to do some weird hacky stuff? You want to throw implants on boxes? Just look at PowerShell Empire. If you want the hotness? That's the hotness. If you want the fundamentals, that's what's coming up. So we're going to do this by looking at three prototypes for implants. We're going to start with the super, super basic baby stuff, which is a downloader, which you've all undoubtedly seen, because I want to get on the same page. Once we're on the same page, we'll move to something slightly more complicated, but still easy. We'll, we'll do a bind shell. After the bind shell, we're going to go for a weird data scraper, and that's where we go off the rails with all kinds of weird stuff. Um, after the implants, we'll look at packaging execution. So disclaimers, though, for the code. Um, I have written this to show you. I have written this to lead you through things. You can run it. It is functional. However, you probably don't want to deploy this like really giant, verbose, flowery code 
like in the real world. If you're actually doing a red team exercise, you probably shouldn't use this. Um, most of it's over verbose, most of it's flowery. Uh, flowery. Um, you will see a few inconsistencies, and that's about uh, displaying things. Um, for example, when I'm referencing .NET assemblies, I'm dropping the system prefix, because that's not necessary. Um, we can get into that later, and it doesn't really matter. Um, you will see lines, some, I've tried to be good about it, where something spans multiple lines, and you do have to do line continuations. I have put those in there, uh, but just be careful that this is formatted for you to look at right here, not to run. Plus, like, um, PowerPoint, there's all kinds of weird smart quotes, quotes things. It's not going to work anyway. But anyway, so let's get to implants. Let's write some stuff. Let's get going. We're going to start with a downloader. Um, pretty basic operation here. Download stuff, execute it, right? Simple workflow. So let us have a look. You've all undoubtedly seen some variation of this code, I hope. Um, very simple. We do, uh, you know, I have a laser pointer here. Let me, uh, there we go. Um, very simple. Built in, built in command, invoke expression, runs code from a string, not hard. Um, we have invoke re web request, which is also cool. Downloads stuff for us. Super easy. Uh, we're going to throw that out. We're going to pull a property out of the, of the object we get back, because PowerShell is object based, not text based. Uh, that's the content, and we're going to run it. It's pretty simple. So, this is the same thing. You've probably seen this, actually, rather than the first one. Uh, this is the exact same thing using shortcuts, using PowerShell aliases that are built, built in. Um, this is the, the IEX thing you're going to see all over the place. Um, the drawback, of course, with this is somebody might be sneaky, and they might not want to get hacked, so they might I don't know, remove these aliases from PowerShell in their profile, then your hot code doesn't work because you use IEX instead of invoke expression. General, generally with PowerShell, if you're at the command line, go ahead and use shortcuts. If you're writing code, do not. Use, the, use full everything, full command names, full parameter names, just do it, be clean. Hopefully we can be on the same page about that. <laughs> this is a better version. You've probably also seen this as well. Um, we're mixing PowerShell and .NET, and this is what we're going to do for the rest of everything else. Um, we're still using invoke expression here, at least by its alias, to execute code from a string. Um, but we're calling the new object commandlet built into PowerShell, um, instantiating a .NET object, the, net, the system net web client, downloading a string, executing, awesome. This is like every POC you've seen is probably this. Uh, the reason to do this is PowerShell version compatibility. Uh, this works in 2.0. Uh, invoke web expression does not exist until PowerShell 3. Do you care? Maybe. I mean, how many of you guys have seen Windows 2008 boxes still running around? Yeah? 08 or 2? Came with PowerShell 2. Um, maybe people didn't upgrade. Focus on compatibility. It's very important. So that was, that's super basic. Are we on the same page with everything, guys? We're cool? All right, I think so. Uh, I can't click on the thing. This is tragic. It doesn't like it. Well, if IEX is working with 2.0, or 3, what are you using? IEX? Hmm? Because you said invoke doesn't work on Starbucks. Invoke web request doesn't work in 2.0. So you use IEX, but you have to use that um, system net web client to download instead of invoke expression. Okay. So we're going to mix PowerShell, .NET, hopefully pretty seamlessly. So. That was easy. Let's look at a bind shell. Slightly more complicated. Uh, we're going to do the same things. We're going to mix PowerShell and we're going to mix .NET. Uh, there are a couple of other things that we need to be aware of when we mm, up our complication game a little bit. Um, pretty basic uh, functionality. We're going to hang out on the network, wait for someone to connect, eat their data, run it. Super simple, right? So we get to start by jumping right into sockets programming. Who loves sockets programming? I love sockets programming. Uh, and you may think, hey, man, PowerShell, you do all the stuff automatically for me. It's magic. Like, yeah, we can download web pages. There's some stuff you can do. You can do uploads. But a lot of stuff you do by hand. Like, if you need a socket, make a socket. We do this with .NET. Um, 
not particularly hard. Um, we're just using the, the, the PowerShell new object commandlet to instantiate a .NET object, uh, and we're going to start messing with stuff. Um, very typical sockets programming. It's very easy in .NET. Um, creating an endpoint, creating a listener on that endpoint, starting the listener. There's some magic. There's some stuff here. Right? There'll be some stuff in the middle, but, the, but then we want to close at the end. Uh, just because you're writing things that you're going to shove off on someone else's box to mess with them doesn't mean you shouldn't follow good programming practices. <laughs> close your sockets. <laughs> Really, you, you, throw, you throw malware, you throw, something, you throw something in somebody's box and you expect it to be long-lived, what happens if it crashes? Uh, yeah, do a good job. Write your code correctly. But that's basic framework there. After we do that and we wait for a connection, because that's, that's, that's blocking, you don't need to get into it, but that, the, the listen, the listener start will wait until we have a connection established. No execution will happen until that until that connection happens. Once it does, we can move on. So we don't have to worry about paneling uh, events. We'll go on inside of that area where I said stuffies in the previous slide. Uh, we'll do a couple of things. Um, we'll do a little forever loop here to start, uh, start our pro with our process. We're going to accept um, the connection. Uh, what this does is, if you're at all familiar with sockets programming, um, if you wondered why you can have a web server listening on port 80 and like 1,000 people can connect to it, you have a listening socket, and you actually accept that connection on a different socket. That's what this will do. What listener accept TCB client will do is we'll give you a new socket separately. Um, you can go ahead and, and enjoy that guy, um, and of course, and close it when you're done. Let's go deeper, another level into our loops, and then buffers showed up. And you're probably thinking earlier, like, hey, PowerShell, magical, you know, .NET. There's all this really cool type unsafe stuff we don't care about. Um, you wouldn't think you'd have to manage buffers, but you totally do. Uh, we're doing stuff that's not necessarily PowerShell native. We have access to it, but it requires a little bit more programming. Um, so we're going to do that here with uh, some buffers. We're going to need to create a buffer to hold data. We're going to read off the network. Um, types are super important when you're dealing with underlying .NET objects. PowerShell doesn't really kind of care. You can throw anything in whatever variable. It'll try and figure out the best it can. No big deal. Um, we're talking to things beneath PowerShell now. So we have to be specific. We need a buffer. Uh, we are instantiating that buffer uh, by declaring a variable, read buffer here, um, that is of a type that is a byte array. Right? Super easy. Uh, we're, losing some, we're using some PowerShell magic to save uh, some time. We don't have to do any weird system calls. We don't have to do any, any malloc or calics, whatever. Um, we're just going to iterate over the numbers 0 to 1,024 because I'm a heathen and I want to use 1,025 bytes instead of 1,024 because, you know, heathen. Um, we're pipelining through in PowerShell, similar to Bash, right, pipeline. Um, and we're going to execute a block of code for each object that we come in. So we're going to get the numbers 0 through 1,024. We're going to completely ignore them. We're just going to execute code that's going to write a 0 back out. Um, we are essentially instantiating a, uh, a 1K uh, zero, initial, 0 initialized buffer. Initialize your memory. I know this is not C. I don't care. Initialize your memory. Just do it. Um, command buffer, TCP. TCP stream accept, all basic socket stuff. If you guys are running stuff down, don't worry about it because the code's published. Because um, I got my numbers wrong, I, I was going to set the code to publish at like exactly 450, and I can't do math, so it published at 250. Because um, everything, you know, whatever. It's up there, don't worry about it. You don't have to remember any of this. I don't expect you to remember this from the slides. It's, it's crazy. Um, reading from our buffers appending to a command buffer. And there's another important thing on this slide. This slide is, is for two reasons. One's the buffer. The other is text encoding. Uh, you can see down here, we've got text encoding. We're calling uh, a static, uh, some static methods on a .NET object. And we're converting from our input buffer into a string. ASCII gets string makes sense, right? We think we've got some ASCII bytes. We're going to convert that to a string. Um, it's kind of important because 
.NET internally uh, uses, it's either UCS2 or UTF-16. Um, it might otherwise be expecting that you have two byte long characters. So when you're not dealing with that, either way, when you're dealing with bytes, you're dealing with characters, you need to be specific. Um, I am specifically saying, give me, you know, this is an ASCII, this is, these are ASCII bytes, give me a .NET string, which is a PowerShell string. Not too bad. A um, little bit more stuff. Uh, we're going to keep adding to our buffer. We'll read, uh, we'll read back the last character of the buffer. If it's a new line, we'll go ahead and execute everything in it. Um, very simple. Uh, a lot of the code you'll see out there for bind shells does something really stupid. It reads from the buffer and executes every time. So that's cool if you're just going to like netcat a payload in, but if you want interactive access, it doesn't work. You sit there and you type, uh, I want to do like git process, and you type g, and then the shell receives g and executes it. What's going to happen? Nothing. Uh, be careful about your input, your input control. Um, some kind of trigger to know that you need to execute, like your last, your last character was a new line, uh, makes sense. Um, we're going to use invoke expression again, like we saw on the first, the first guy there, um, to execute whatever's in our command buffer. Just like bash, we're going to redirect all of our, our output. We're going to re redirect standard error to standard in. That's what this two greater than ampersand one thing is. I really hope you guys know your bash programming. Um, and this out string is critically important. Um, PowerShell being object-based will return objects. That may be what you want, it may not be what you want. Um, PowerShell display on the console is controlled by types. They are mostly preset, pre-installed. When you have an object coming out to the console, PowerShell figures out how to display that. That's selecting which properties show up, how we format them. We're going to format things as lists, strings. You can customize all this, but by default, PowerShell is not going to necessarily give you data out. It'll give you an object, and it'll kind of figure out how to display that however. If you're doing this remotely over a socket, that's not going to work. You need to convert whatever you have on your output to some nice text data. So we can convert that to some bytes, and we can send that back out of our, our socket and close it, reset our buffer. So a little bit more there. A little bit weird, talking about buffers, you know, about .NET stuff. Um, are we cool on that? Yeah, because we're going to get into some weird stuff now. That wasn't the weird stuff. We're about to get weird stuff. Uh, basic things to take away from this before we get to the weird stuff. Um, this is a pattern you're going to see over and over again. Uh, we're going to see PowerShell because it's convenient, because we can rapidly iterate. Uh, we're going to see PowerShell for control flow, control flow, for logic, for behavior. And then we'll talk to .NET um, when we need to do the heavy lifting. Um, there are lots of reasons for that. Uh, it's I.O. is faster when you bypass some of the PowerShell commandlets. Uh, things might just not be available in PowerShell. But .NET's there. We have, in most cases, full access to it, so go nuts. So now we look at a little data scraper. This is where things get a little crazy. Um, might as well just do it. So it's really easy to grab and exfiltrate basic data from a shell. You might see something like this um, for various bash scripts. Um, actually, we execute uh, a command here, capture data, and then we can push that data back out to a server that we control. Uh, invoke web request can be used to download, but it can also be used to upload. Um, pretty simple, you just say post, here's your post body, no big deal. So in one line, um, normally it would be one line, especially if you use shortcuts, uh, we can grab, grab some data, send it out, exfiltrate, super easy. Um, who remembers zone alarm? Remember zone alarm? Yeah, I feel sorry for all of you. Um, I switched to black eyes to Fender because I was a cool kid and it sounded cooler. Um, so if you're, if you're poking around your network and you're like threat hunting 
and you see a PowerShell process connecting to like a bunch of servers around the internet, is that going to look suspicious to you? It's going to look a little suspicious to me. Um, so maybe we don't want to use PowerShell to move data. Maybe we should use something else. Um, something people often overlook is the, Mac the Microsoft Background Intelligent Transfer Service. Uh, that service does things like download Windows updates. But it also uh, does the Windows error reporting uploads. Um, it's there, it's on every Windows box. Yes, you can disable it. You'll probably have some headaches if you do. Um, but to be less suspicious when we're exfiltrating data, um, we can just use a background intelligent transfer service. It's available over COM, or PowerShell just gives us a couple commands. It's really, really easy to take data from a file, uh, t take a file, and upload it to wherever we want. Uh, Drawback is that it transfers files, so you have to actually write a file to disk, which might make you show up. But on the plus side, something that's probably already got um, firewall exceptions to if you're running any host-based stuff, um, is what you're using to exfiltrate. Bits, on, bits moving data on the network, not suspicious. So that's why we want to use it. Um, if you want to use bits for uploading, you know, go to Azure, grab a Windows server with IIS, install the bits stuff on it. It's not hard. Um, or maybe you use, like, uh, PHP. Um, it's PHP, so come on. Um, maybe you use a little PHP handler to handle your bits upload. And maybe someone, because they love you, wrote one earlier this week, and we'll make it available. So you can just, so this, it becomes as easy as this one. I will totally do that for you. Um, I don't love you that much. It's kind of a love-hate thing because it is PHP, and this code can absolutely be used to DOS your box, but eh, whatever. Go learn to write it yourself if you want to make it decent. <laughs> but at least it's out there. Another option is to use Internet Explorer. Now, on, on my systems, very unusual to have Internet Explorer doing anything. Um, but if it's available, if it's in use, um, we can use Internet Explorer to upload data um, from PowerShell. We do that by instantiating a com object, um, Internet Explorer to application. It's made. Uh, also, like most of the Microsoft Office apps are there that are totally available. Um, we can grab an instance of IE in the background um, and have it do work for us. This is really convenient if IE is, is something that can talk on the network, except for if you never use IE and you know that little annoying pop-up that says, hey, you should enable all the stuff that lets us track you, or do you want to customize settings? Um, this will actually make that pop up. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so make sure that's set first before you go using this, like write something to the registry, yeah. Otherwise, it's pretty simple. It's, it's similar to bits upload or invoke web request. Uh, we can give it a target a URL. Um, in this case, we have, to, we have to provide bytes rather than a string, because it won't convert for us. But we can provide some bytes, upload. And now we have Internet Explorer uploading data out of the network for us rather than PowerShell. Slightly less suspicious if you're looking at the box. So options for upload. Let's get back to uh, grabbing some data. Um, Another thing you may see is um, crawling through uh, the machine, looking for, for items of interest like uh, your PuTTY sessions. If you have PuTTY installed and you've saved sessions, we can pull those saved session configs out of the registry. Why do we want to do that? Um, because if you have a, uh, a public key specified, um, that will point us right to it. Um, thrashing a disk, walking through the entire C drive, entire user profiles to look for data uh, that you want to exfiltrate is definitely something you can do, but if someone like clicks on a link at a, at a website and all of a sudden their hard drive starts grinding, even though you know, we're getting all SSD now, like suspicious, right? So maybe we don't do that. Maybe we look for pointers to the data we want. Um, same pattern as we've been saying. We use PowerShell to grab data. Um, we're piping through the, through the pipeline here to kind of get everything in a nice format for us. You can select objects here with the unique flag. So that we wind up with a, a list of unique keys. If you have 100 saved sessions that use three keys, we'll wind up with three keys in our list, and then we will do something to each of those keys. Let's get weird. 
.NET has fun I.O. stream APIs. Um, we want to use these if possible because it allows us to manipulate data um, as we're doing things to it. We can establish a pipeline for that data, like commands in PowerShell or Bash. Um, and it's faster. Um, a lot of the, the PowerShell, generally in PowerShell, you use uh, get content, set content commandlets to uh, read and write data between files. Um, it can be a little bit faster if you give uh, the read con the uh, the get content command the the raw parameter. It won't do any magic on it, but it's still not the fastest option. If you have lots of data, you have big chunks of data, you want to keep your memory utilization low. Um, use .NET I/O streams. Super easy. Um, what we do here is set up a, a bucket to hold some compressed data. Uh, we then set up another member of our stream here, um, a gzip stream for compression. This targets the memory, uh, the memory bucket we made earlier. And then finally, we grab a file stream uh, that's targeting our key. Um, basic file I.O. Once we have this path set up, it doesn't matter. In this case, the putty keys are very small. It's not really a big deal. If you have large chunks of data, um, this is really nice because we don't have to manage reading and writing and buffers if we're over the network. doesn't matter. Um, we can just tell the file stream to copy to our gzip stream. Those bytes get read. They go in. They get pushed through that kind of pipeline of, um, of I.O. streams we've created and close them up at the end, and the result is a bucket in memory of compressed, um, compressed data. From there, very simple, uh, convert that compressed data to an array, because this command expects that. We convert that array of bytes to a base64 stream, and then we can upload it via any method we want. But, you tell me, you, know, you want to do more than just copying files. Of course you do. We're going to do some weird stuff um, that, like spying on the user. I want to see for this uh, what the user is doing, what application they're working with. And their PowerShell doesn't natively have this uh, ability, but this is uh, something that the, Win the Windows API does provide. There's a, a function called get foreground window. Um, I won't bore you with the details of Windows GUI programming, um, but it will return a handle to whatever window is foremost in the, uh, the user's desktop session. So if that's PowerShell, Chrome, whatever, it'll tell you the handle of the window that's up front. Um, the common, the official way to access Windows API from PowerShell is with add type. Um, don't use it. Eh, if you're prototyping, sure. Don't actually use it um, outside of the lab and prototyping because this uh, will, if, if you have good um, blue team, will set off all kinds of flags. Um, it looks like we're doing this in memory. It looks like we're providing some C-sharp uh, and then just magically adding it to PowerShell. Um, this actually writes to disk in the background. It writes a temporary file, compiles our code, and then loads it in. So if you have any naughtiness in there that's going to get picked up by AV, um, you've just shot yourself in the foot. So don't use add type. There is a much more convoluted way we can get access to certain uh, Windows API calls. Um, and that's with a, with a little bit of reflection. We don't have every single Windows API available in PowerShell without doing some weird stuff. but. As you can imagine, PowerShell being run, being run on Windows probably talks to the Windows API. In any case where PowerShell or some .NET stuff already has links to Windows API functions, we can find and use those references. So getting, getting the address of the window that's in the foreground is something that's very common. Um, it just so happens to be loaded um, by PowerShell. So we can find a reference to, um, to the target, uh, the target, uh, I am too tired, to the target assembly. 
if, if you don't know that this is in this assembly, it doesn't matter. There's a tool out there, the um, Microsoft Scripting Guide blog. Um, there's a little snippet of PowerShell that will let you give it a uh, Windows API function and it will find it if it's imported. So that's how I know that's in there. You don't have to necessarily know this off. Just run the tool, it's not a big deal. Um, so we're going to just look for a reference to this, power, this um, .NET assembly that's loaded. Uh, this happens to be for PowerShell. Once we find it, we can get a reference to a specific type, uh, which is an object inside that assembly. And then we can grab a reference to the actual method declared. So we don't have to compile any weird code on, this, on, on the fly, but we can still grab things that we weren't supposed to grab in PowerShell. That's all like the really weird PowerShell stuff. Like, how the hell do they do that? There's no commandlet. Fine, wrap Windows API. That's what's happening in the background of a lot of these things. So we can grab a reference, we can use it, we can call it whenever we want to. It's called a little bit differently because eh, it's kind of there, um, but we can call whatever we want. Why would I want to find out what, what window a user has in the foreground? Maybe I want to look for certain programs. Maybe I want to see what you're doing. What are these? I don't know. They're just random software I put there. So we can combine, again, PowerShell, .NET, Windows API. Um, now that we've imported that function, the, the get foreground window, um, we can just kind of keep track of a buffer here, loop forever, and we'll just constantly get the address of the foreground window, and we can use the PowerShell command that get processed to look for the processes that are running on the box and filter those down to processes that have a main window handle matching the handle that we got. This essentially gives us back a reference to the process that is currently in the foreground. If we find that, if we have a, uh, if we have a match, we can do some stuff. All we really need to do is, it's, it's super easy in this case because PowerShell lets you interact with the clipboard. Um, get the clipboard content, if it's not like the last bit of clipboard content, upload it, done. So whenever you're in a browser, I will every one second check for what you have in the clipboard and I will upload that as it comes. Are you pasting in passwords, you're pasting in URLs, pasting in driver's license number? I can, I can watch it. There, there are technically better ways to write that, uh, to write that type of code, but if you wanna do it in PowerShell so you can iterate quickly, um, all you have to do is, is write as much PowerShell as you can, and you can call out for the one Windows API function or the two Windows API functions you really need. Uh, you don't have to write an entire C application and push that through. So that was weird. Um, questions? Okay, all right. So assuming that we have code written, um, we need to package our code, we need to get out and execute it. Um, you've gotta protect whatever it is that you've written. Make sure it gets where you wanna go. The, pretty basic. Take whatever you have, throw it in a little, little box, a little protected, protected container, throw it out there, let it do its thing. What you will see over and over again is this. Remember this guy from earlier, our super basic example? Um, yeah, you can, you can embed that in Word documents. You can paste it, email, whatever. Um, quotes can be a problem. Mm -hmm. um, so we want to wrap this up. Um, packaging is really simple. Everything's usually wrapped in Base64. Um, not hard. You know, you just have built-in uh, Base64 conversion function in .NET. Right? Um, take our text, convert it to bytes, convert it to base64. We have you know, some string. Um, PowerShell is really nice because it lets you, in, uh, lets you execute from that directly. Um, it lets you immediately execute uh, UTF-16, base64 encoded code. Um, who does process audit logging? 
All right, so it was like three of you are okay, the rest are getting hacked. Um, <laughs> encoded command is, is kind of a big red flag, you should never use it. I was like, don't use it, don't ever use it. Um, I was listening around uh, at a place one time that shall not be named, and I was doing some stuff, uh, all kinds of PowerShell trickeries and, and naughtiness, and um, getting ready to leave for the day, and I have a instant message window pops up. I'm like, all right, cool, what's that? Uh, some guy, uh, he's probably gonna ask me to restart a server or something, no big deal. And he's like typing, nothing. Typing, nothing. No message other than hi. Typing, nothing. This goes on for a few minutes. Like, what's going on? So I look up the guy's contact card, and it's a guy who shall not be named, um, Department uh, Global Information Security Response Team. <laughs> shit. <laughs> what did I do? <laughs> shit, shit, shit. Uh, let me delete everything. I'll just delete everything. Oh, crap. They're already watching me. Maybe I shouldn't delete anything. Uh, turns out they just saw encoded command, and they're like, hey, we saw this PowerShell command that was executed. Is that okay? Is that fine? The malware usually uses that. I'm like, no, no, dude, dude, it's fine. Don't worry about it. There's no need to look into anything else on my box. <laughs> it's totally fine. Go away. It's like five o'clock, just go home. It's like, oh, okay, fine. You know, we'll, we'll follow up. No need to follow up. It's fine. Go home. I was lucky. We were cool. Don't use it. Um, don't use it because it gets flagged in audit logging, and don't use it because Base 64, you can expect maybe a 30% overhead um, in stuff. Does this look like a 30% overhead from that initial, initial command? Uh, I didn't do the math, it's roughly 230%. Uh, I mentioned earlier, .NET internally uses two byte characters, so let's use, it's like so UCS2. Um, so this is a lot bigger than it needs to be. If you don't use encoded command and do this yourself, right, decode yourself, um, and just ex, you know, cause the execution yourself with invoke expression um, or whatever other trickery you want, um, you have more control over packaging. The main reason to do this is to st stuff things in the middle uh, like encryption. Even a basic, um, basic XOR or bit shift uh, will make things a little bit harder to find. Uh, it is possible to search your logs for base 64. Um, I think Lee Holmes has the sample code. Yeah, it's Lee Holmes. Um, f weird thing about the way base 64 works, I'm not gonna get super deep into it, but um, certain things get pushed out. Uh, you might, if you encode you know, the word Bob, it, you have a certain base 64 string. If you put um, a letter in front of that, it's gonna look completely different, and that's okay. Um, but there's only a couple of little variations, so what you can actually do is, if you're looking for a specific string in Base64, you can encode all the, you, you can look for what the Base64 encoding would be for that in all cases. There's only about three um, potential Base64 strings, and you can search your logs for that. Uh, if you're looking, you can search, search your, process, uh, your process audit logs for command lines um, that have invoke expression in them. Pretty easy to find. If you shift that, if you use awkward encoding, uh, throwing an XOR in there, a bit shift, um, that makes it a lot harder to do. You have to actually go after someone. Um, someone who's threat hunting or someone who is um, doing DFR will still find you, but at least you're off the automated log. Someone actually has, has to get out of their chair and go get you, um, which might be enough. So, um, we talked about writing some stuff, and we talked about hacking some stuff. Are we still okay on all this? I'm touching on, on weird pieces of .NET you need to know exist, are we all cool? Um, we should probably get to execution, especially since I'm behind schedule. Um, not that. Not that. Remember that slide? That was a hilarious slide. All right. So, we set things up, we throw them on a box, they eventually have to blow up and do something, right? Otherwise, what's the point? 
If you don't get your code running, it doesn't really matter. Um, PowerShell stuff, you can run like anything else. You can run PowerShell EXE, you can pass it scripts, you can pass it, pass it stuff. It's fine. Like, if you were to invoke PowerShell um, with some string, you could uh, even invoke with uh, the shortcuts because you like shortcuts. Um, not bad. You can do things like throw this into the image file execution options that everyone has always seen. Right? No big deal. Um, don't read that. That's a lot of stuff. Um, but that's kind of lame. Like, I don't like that. Uh, we can use WMI instead. It's way better. You don't really care about what WMI is. You only care why we're going to use it. Um, it's pervasive. It's everywhere. If you have a Windows box, it has WMI on it. Um, most important part is that Windows admins don't like it. Uh, oh, some do. It's kind of like a magic black box. Like people are like, oh yeah, WMI is that thing that sometimes gets corrupted. Eh, they don't like to go there. Um, the place that you are uncomfortably you are uncomfortable being is the place I want to be, because you're not going to find me there. You're not going to come looking for me. Uh, we can use the WMI event subscription model to execute. Uh, it's pretty simple. Um, we start with an event filter. Um, this just looks for things that happen on the box, filters them down to you uh, some kind of way. Um, we have an event consumer um, that gets triggered when we find a matching pattern. And we link these with a filter to consumer binding. Um, three objects need to be created. The filter to consumer binding is what gets logged, by the way. Are you guys logging? Are you guys reading all your Windows logs and forwarding them to a central store? Are you? I'm going to take that as a no. Uh, <laughs> even if you are, are you, are you pulling all of them? Or are you pulling the WMI operational log? Eh, probably not. That's the only way you're going you're to spot this um, in real time. So, <laughs> well, that was interesting. Um, <laughs> So we know what we need to do. We need those three things. We need an event filter, that's our trigger. Uh, we need an action, and we need to link them together, and we need to hope it works. Um, it's actually pretty easy. Um, so take this sample. We're going to execute uh, this little command here. Um, we're going to do something off disk for now because we're lazy. We can start with selecting a event filter in, in uh, WMI. Um, I suggest um, looking for activities that happen on the box on a regular basis. So triggering, say, whenever we have a service change. Um, this means you're going to probably fire a lot more often than you want to, but there are ways to deal with that, like control, uh, ways checking, of checking for control. If you're doing a bind shell on a specific port, it's really easy, because if, the bind, if you can't bind to the port, there's already something there, just die. Who cares? Um, you can be fairly resilient that way. Um, I don't like the other options that are, you generally see, they usually look for the system uptime in a certain range. That happens once per reboot. I don't like to reboot, reboot my boxes very often. So why would I do that? Um, certain industries may only patch quarterly. If your code crashes, uh, you don't get another chance for it to execute for another quarter. That sucks. So um, looking for modified services, which includes when a service state changes, when it starts or stops. Uh, is a reasonable way to get actions so long as you, in your code, filter it down so you don't fire too often. We then need to look at a consumer. Uh, we can use a command, a command line event consumer. Um, not that bad. We can create, create an object, um, give it a command line to execute. Super easy. We link these up with a filter to consumer binding, uh, which is easy because we saved references to the first two objects. No big deal. Whenever a service changes, our code's going to get executed. Mm, I don't think that's too good, though, because we have something on disk. We're executing file off disk. I think we can do a little bit better than this. Um, this is a readback of a event consumer, that was a command line event consumer that was created. Uh, is there anything here that looks like it's of potential fun? Right? Does it look useful? I'll give you a hint. Um, there's a lot more that's output here than I put on the screen. So it's one of these couple of things. No, no. See this window title guy here? I wonder what that is. 
Uh, turns out it's a string that we can throw stuff into. So instead of executing from disk, I'm going to change. We can change our command line event consumer here to read back that WMI object and just execute whatever we find in the window title property. I don't know exactly how big that can be because I was testing it on my box and I really was not trying to kill my box that hard. Um, I got 10K in there, so you've got some room to work with. Um, the full command to, to create that object looks a little bit different. Um, modified command line template, um, modified window title with what the code we actually want to execute, and we let that go. When we read that, that object back, uh, we have code all in WMI, um, in the WMI database, so we don't have extra files on this. It's still backed by disk, but there's no like PS1 files lining around, and so we can execute this whenever we want. Um, it's great. Uh, the really, the, the number one greatest fantastic thing about this is uh, WMI is available over RPC and uh, web services management. Which means if you are on like an admin workstation network that has RPC access uh, to other boxes, if you are on a monitoring server that has RPC access, but you don't necessarily want to open a shell on a box or get interactive on a box, you can set this up remotely. That's the most fun part. So, I know there was a lot. I wanted to introduce you to things so that you can go work on them later. Um, if you want code, uh, I have the code written out in step-by-step -step chunks like I showed you here, so you can go and look for references. Um, go play, have fun, enjoy. <laughs> you want that? So, there's a little white NFC dot on my talk on the board that you can scan. Also, I have stickers in my pocket, um, Twitters, whatever. There's 80 billion ways to get it. Don't worry about it. Not hard. Um, questions. We have uh, less than two minutes for questions. Yes? What about uh, PowerShell? PowerShell scripts a lot. Well, that sucks. <laughs> 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 um, there are a lot of ways to dodge that kind of stuff. Um, some work well, some don't. If you're in a position, if you're if you're post uh, exploitation, um, you can probably can like rewrite group policy registry keys first. Uh, they're just not persistent, obviously. Uh, basically, you're screwed. Uh, deal with it. Okay. Like, who who was okay? Who raised their hands for um, log forwarding? Like like two people, three people. Like, who cares? Just do it. Like, they'll get you in DIFR, but you already have their data. Doesn't matter. Uh, well, it doesn't matter, but eh. Uh, any more questions? Any more questions? What about the old obfuscation? That is awesome. Just call Daniel Bohannon, go to his GitHub, just use it. Like, don't write your own because you're not going to be better than his code. <laughs> um, best option. There are some weird options. Um, you you want to use the options that don't. Um, rely on invoke expression because they're a little bit harder to go through. Again, if it's there, a DFR guy is going to get it. A threat hunter is going to get it. Um, you just don't want to show up on logs early enough to set off alarms. There's always a trace somewhere. Just buy yourself time. Questions? Questions? No? No questions? Okay. That was Wes, you turned that on. <laughs> I'm sad you can't hear my boss music that I picked for this right now, but that's OK. I had, I had to do credits, I had to do shots. I'm bringing greets back, OK? I'm bringing back the greets. No more questions? No comment. Uh, uh, no comment. Uh, new object, how about new object? There's too many. No, no, no comment. But what about O days? <laughs> Man, we get popped. Every company I've worked at gets popped by two-year-old vulnerabilities. Do not fucking talk to me about O days. I do not. I do not need them.
All right, thank you. Go look, go get the code, experiment yourself. This is meant to introduce you to those features. I remember there was no hotness here. I want you to know what those features are, where they exist, what they're used for, so you can go home tonight, learn a little bit about PowerShell, and write some stuff that's going to be a pain in the ass for me on Monday. Thank you. Right. Big round of applause for Chris. I'd just like to remind everybody, there's speaker survey cards in the back, so if you liked what you saw, uh, please let us know. Thank you.